Okay, welcome along. Wow, there is a lot of people in the chat at the moment. Um, if you have got questions for today, please use the Q&A feature because there are over 100 people, there are 100 people joining us today. Um, it's going to be really hard for us to keep track through the chat feature, so please use the Q&A feature. Um, the way that this is going to work is we're going to go through some watches. Um, you may have spotted we have sort of two fantastic artists with us today that do art in different ways, uh, one horological and one in um, um, a sort of a more pen and ink based kind of thing. So you're going to be able to ask them questions about those a bit later on. Um, we're going to go through and do introductions now. So my name is Chris. You've probably heard my voice before on the Time for a Pine podcast. If you've been to one of the events, you've met me. I'm the guy at the door holding a beer and ticking your name off on a checklist um, and giving you a sticker with your name on in case you forget it later on. Hopefully you've got your name up on the screen today, so you're not going to forget it. You know where you are. You're at home and you're safe. Um, I am joined by my wonderful host, Matt. Hello, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt, the watch nerd. Um, this might be the first time some of you actually see me. I don't usually show my face, but um, hi, everyone. Um, and Matt, would you like to introduce one of our guests? So my guest today is Lee Ewan Rapati, who is a multidisciplinary uh, designer with a particular interest in uh, topography and drawing watches. You may have seen him online as One Hour Watch, um, where he draws um, a picture of a watch every single day or part of a watch every day on Instagram. Lee, welcome. Hello. Um, so, and my guest, and lots of you have asked how uh, I managed to do this, it's very simple. Roger is a lovely man, and if you get in touch with him and ask him to do things that he's happy with doing, he tends to say yes. Um, so, um, some of you have met Roger, lots of you will, will recognise him and his work. Um, he makes wonderful um, pieces of horology on the Isle of Man, um, and he is joining us from his workshop today. Hello, Roger. Hello, very nice to meet you and nice to uh, have everyone on board. Fantastic. So the way things are going to work today is the same as the last couple of weeks. Each of us have brought a watch along and I'm going to say up front, none of the watches, actually with the exception of Lee's, none of the watches that we are talking about first off are ones we have had anything to do with making. Um, slight spoiler, Roger is going to talk about a watch that he makes but a little bit later on. So if you've got questions about the watches we brought along that none of us made, the time to ask them is as we're talking about them, please use the Q&A feature and we will, we will try and respond if we know the answer to the questions. If not, we'll be very honest and we'll fess up and say we've got no idea, but we might go away and work out the answers and come back to you. And a little bit later on, when you get to see one of, one of Roger's watches and you get to see um, lots of, of Lee's art, you'll be able to ask questions about Roger's watch and Lee's are at that time. So we're going to try and keep things kind of fairly linear so that we don't all get really, really confused. Um, sound good for the panel? First off, does that sound good? Good for me. Wonderful. All good. Cool. Okay, so I am going to switch to a slide deck now, which I'm going to share with all of you. Um, and uh, hopefully the technology will continue to work in the way it has in previous weeks. Nothing will fall over. Um, and I won't cut out like I did last week, leaving Matt with a very odd ending and me thinking everything was still fine. So um, let's try this out and see what happens. Um, bear with me a second. See this, the smoothness of, of kind of almost live TV. Better than Sunday brunch day. Oh, that's fighting talk, surely. Probably. Um, probably. Probably. Um, bear with me, bear with me. Sorry, everybody, please talk amongst yourselves. Um, oh, this is going really well. So the entire slide deck has deleted itself. So that's good. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, no, hang on, hang on, it's coming back. Damn you, Google. Um, other awful software companies are available. You don't have to rely on Google. There's other people that do just as bad a job. Um, to be fair, we are relying on Zoom as well, and they're we, equally dreadful. Yeah, we've got lots of, of poor quality technology going on here. Um, so let's see what happens. Let's see if this works now. Um, okay. Okay, can the panel at least see that? I can. I can. Oh. <laughs> Very nice heading. Ah, can you see a heading? You can see a heading. I can. You can. 
Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Nick can and see people, it. Yes, people, people in the chat can, can see, see it. it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, first up, this is uh, the watch that Roger has chosen to bring along. Um, as we learned in the first show, holding a watch up to a webcam does not work. So these are some pictures that Roger sent in. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Roger now, and you can talk us through, and just let me know when you want me to click forward, and I'll, I'll, I'll run the controls. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yes, as the title says, my first uh, watch is the uh, Hoya um, Ortavia Viceroy. And um, I bought this watch, I think it was about three or four years ago, and is one of those watches which I'd always wanted. So my um, first job was at a company in the northwest of England near Manchester at Tag Heuer. And the, um, I, I sort of joined that place in, I think it was during my time at college. And I used to, I, th I think I started when I was 17 there. And I used to work in the weekends, and summer holidays, and I, I think one day a week. And I was basically sort of put to task to do all the under guarantee work and bracelet shortenings, bracelet repairs, and so on. Um, and these, but these other watches, these uh, Hoyers used to arrive on the bench of the head watchmaker there every so often. And he would have the pleasure of servicing those watches. And I was just always fascinated by them. The uh, mechanism is a caliber 12. And it's sort of quite an iconic mechanism, really. It's, um, yeah, and as a young, impressionable watchmaker, it was the holy grail of watches at that time. And uh, something that I always aspired to own and eventually did. So I think I, think I have a picture here of, of the Calibre 12 as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it was quite a, um, an unusual movement at the time. It was um, a modular movement. So there's basically a base caliber, which has um, an automatic winding mechanism underneath the uh, chronograph mechanism. And then this chronograph mechanism, mechanism sits above it. And it's just striking. And to me, as, as I say, as a young watchmaker, it was just fascinating and a world I wanted to get into. But sadly, due to my um, position in the company, I never got my hands on one of the watches. So uh, I ended up having to buy one. But uh, yeah, lovely watch. And a fascinating story. You know, the, um, I think the next slide is the advert, isn't it? Oh, earlier slide. <laughs> <laughs> and um, is the advert for the watch. And this watch saved Hoyer. And at the time, um, Hoyer organized, you know, they were struggling and they organized this sort of deal with uh, Viceroy um, sort of cigarettes. And I think if you took one of those tokens into a store, you'd get a big discount on one of the Hoyer watches. And it just transformed the uh, company and so yeah it's it's a fascinating watch from many different angles but mainly it's just to satisfy a niche from when I was a young watchmaker and never able to get my hands on one of these watches very very cool so um I think one of the questions I got in the week after we announced you were coming on was what watches does Roger own and this has answered the question at least partly <laughs> yeah um yeah. uh yeah very very cool um any questions from anybody? Anybody on the panel got any questions about this or observations? Anything at all? Just a couple of questions in the chat. Do you, do you want to go through them? Well, I mean, I guess so. Roger, one of the questions was why did you go for the rice, the Viceroy itself, over one of the other different types of of Octavia, such as the Seafert or whatever? Um, probably money. <laughs> <laughs> available money I think is always the overriding thing um, and I just found this on the uh, internet on eBay as many people do and uh, is a good example and, and again the movement is in really great condition and that's what sort of swung it for me um, it's just in perfect condition there's a couple of higher line scratches on it but is untouched cases very fresh and um, original really and that's what I liked about the watch one of the questions was also about the movement. When you were talking about it, you suggested that the um, 
the the module for the chronograph was on top of the automatic winding. Presumably yeah. that's just in the normal way. I mean, this, we're looking at it top down here through the dial, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So James, yes. there's a question from James and the and the audience about the rotor being underneath the mechanism. It is, but the dial is the dial is here in front of us. It's not like the the new Singer, for example, that's made by um uh, made by Agonor. It's not it's not <laughs> not that advanced. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I think we move on to the next watch. Um, so this is uh, this is Lee. So Lee, you you are in control now, my friend. Okay, as dangerous excellent. as that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So this is the international watch seminar watch um, that I got to put together um, in the past uh, few months. So this is, it was in October, and um, so just a bit of background on the seminar itself. It's a weekend seminar uh, run by James, who was on the first podcast uh, or get together, and uh, Johan Tenhoff, and they run it in South London. And basically, um, you get together for a weekend, and you get a watch with a blank movement. You get to learn how to um, take it apart, put it together, take it apart, and then do some finishing techniques on the movement. And uh, by the end of the weekend, you case everything up and you get to walk away with the watch. So I was invited to take part, and um, this, is the, this is the piece that I put together over the weekend. And um, it was an enormous amount of fun. It was kind of my first experience really working um, with my hands in terms of um, getting to know some watchmaking techniques and that kind of thing. So for somebody who's been um, very much an enthusiast and maybe a bit of a hobbyist for a few years, it was, um, just an incredible experience. And um, basically the watch is a 42 millimeter um, uh, piece with a steel case and it uses an ETA 6498. So the next photo shows the movement of the watch, which is all done uh, up in perlage and then is, is gilded. And um, we also had a chance to blue a, a blue few screws with, um, with a flame. Um, which was which was a lot of fun and um, the other part of the, this piece that is very interesting is you can customize the the dial and um, the other half of my creative practice um, apart from watches is typography and so what I had done is taken the project that I made during my master's uh, degree in the University of Reading, which was a typeface designed for watches, and tried to put it on an actual watch. So if you go to the next photo, I believe, yeah, so this is how it appears on the dial. Um, the typeface is called Matic, and I just wanted to test the uh, uppercase letters and um, in the file, this, this uh, text is around three point so if you think of a Word document, normally you're working at 10.5 or 12 point. So this is, this is quite small, um, but thanks to the precision printing uh, of pad printing, which is uh, what is used on this dial, the, the crispness of the letters is, is carries right through. Um, and so a few more things, I guess, about the, the typeface. Um, this was all inspired by uh, vintage watch numerals and letters from the mid 20th century. Um, there are a few characteristics that you find in typography on watches, um, such as a flat bar on the top of the A, uh, as well as on the top of the four, which makes the uh, letters and numerals a little bit more boxy and gives them um, what I like to describe as room to breathe. And it was just, um, really wonderful to be able to actually see this on the dial and um, basically figure out what is working, what is not working. There are definitely a few things that are not working, so I'm very happy to kind of um, identify those and be able to progress on this, uh, on this project, which is, it's still ongoing. But um, yeah, just a very fun watch and, and something that is uh, uh, unique and, and um, I, I enjoy looking at it uh, basically every day and um, and yeah yeah so it's a good watch good experience and um, and yeah here's uh, 
here is what the typeface uh, looks like in terms of just the digital reproduction. That's very cool. So did you design it right from the beginning, Lee, to the, with the knowledge it was always going to go tiny, tiny, tiny? Uh, how does that process work? So because the inspiration was taken from um, typography that is already very small, there are um, inherent characteristics in each letter form or each numeral. For instance, this is a very wide uh, font and the basically the smaller you go generally letter forms and numerals tend to get a little bit wider and that helps the readability at small sizes um, and there are things that on watches they do especially so I mentioned before the horizontal extension bars on the tops of the A's uh, or the fours can can um, permeate kind of through the the visual language of the of the typeface there are things that are more difficult to see, especially on a stream like this, um, such as ink traps, which are tiny little optical adjustments that are made by the type designer so that when the, um, in the translation from a digital file to actual ink being put on a dial or put on paper, whatever, um, the spread of that ink will be controlled uh, in a way so that it doesn't uh, blob out. And you can, you can see these actually in watches where the, some of the numerals may not have been designed with proper ink traps. Cool. Yeah. Any, any other questions to the panel? Anything in the Q&A, Matt? Uh, a few people commenting on the, on the letters themselves. Um, Dan Wilson saying the uppercase X is very interesting. It's, it's got this, um, that flattened piece in the middle that you kind of talked about just, just now. Yeah, and it's... Um, you don't generally see too many X's. I took some liberties with that that letter. Um, it's exaggerated, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Cool. Thank you. Lovely. On to the next one. So I think we're up with uh, with Matt's watch next, which is it's, I'm going to say this now. This is one of my favourite things that you own that I've seen. This thing oh. fascinates me. Thank you. Um, Nothing so, to do with me. Well, I mean, you fascinate me as well, obviously, we're friends, but uh, this watch in particular is very, very cool. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you now to talk about this. Thank you. Uh, this is the watch I'm wearing today, um, uh, Harboring to Foudroyant from 2010. Um, so it looks pretty straightforward uh, from the front, apart from the slightly weird one to eight on the left-hand side by the, um, where the, the, the numeral nine should be. Um, so this is the first time I think that um, anyone tried to combine these two complications. Um, so this is uh, Maria and Richard Harbring in Austria who used an Etta Valgrange, those kind of base Etta movements, um, adding modules to them. In this case, two. One, a jumping second, so that large second hand will take ground. And secondly, a foudroyant or flying or flashing hand, which is rarely used nowadays, uh, occasionally on kind of... Um, complicated chronographs or, or whatever but I think originally originally might have been used on a few pocket watches um, for racing and things like that can we go into the next one the, the, so this, the cool thing about this for me is it, it does combine those two those two complications um, the dead second the jumping second is very important so I love this way that the, they've um, curved that hand down so there's no Doppler effect it's really really good tick and you can see it see it moving across and there's a lovely counterweight which I think is the next next picture um, but that Fujoy on the left hand side is flashing around basically showing us um, almost exactly how the the escapement is running um, whereas we normally like to see uh, a second hand sweep and most people will buy a mechanical watch to see that swift but but, but steady sweep of a hand this takes all those little ticks it shows you those tiny little ticks, all eight of them on the left-hand side, and then glues them back together again to, to, to show that tick, uh, the big, strong, big, strong jumping second. So the next slide is the, is the movement um, from the back. Ooh, detail's not great on this. Is there another one? Perfect. Um, so we're looking at the back straight through. Um, so where that center jewel is, that goes straight through to the, the cannon pinion and through to the, the second hand. Um, and if you look just below at six o'clock, you'll see another kind of what looks to be a jeweled piece and some very small teeth. Um, effectively, what's happening is the bottom right, you've got the normal escapement. It's, it's, it's moving, it's beating, as you expect. But each of those beats 
is moving um, is is, uh, is is moving a wheel uh, which is feeding directly into the food journal, so that's going to flash around, and each of those small ticks is then building up and applying pressure to that spring that you can see at six o'clock in this picture. Um, so that the sharp teeth above in brass are kind of just waiting for that pressure to build up and after eight ticks it'll tick over. And I've got hopefully a little piece of video on the next slide. This is our first time of doing video in video. So yeah, no pressure at all. This is this is going to be great. So this is this is the, the the watch itself working and you'll see I've tried to slow it down. So one eighth of a second, you can see a bit of backlash on that tiny little hand, as you probably expect, given, given the, the kind of torque that's running through it. And then as it gets to eight, so three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it should just pop round, spring round. Um, quite often when I'm wearing this, people ask me where I'm wearing a quartz watch, um, and I just nod and smile. Um, I, I, th I think it's a, it's a fun thing. I, think, I don't think anyone's... Uh, I don't think anyone's done it before and I don't think anyone's probably going to do it again. So um, hats off to, to Richard Harbring and Maria Harbring. Very cool. Um, any questions from the panel? Matt, any questions in the q and I, I ask this because I can't see because I'm doing some screen sharing and recording. So far we've got, got Jeff saying it's awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Marcus likes the slow-mo. That's Apple for you. Uh, Nice to get the video in. Any real questions? Ah, Simon Fries, repaired food joint complications for GP. Incredibly difficult to produce. Well, there we are. I mean, these guys are producing them in their, you know, in their little atelier in Austria as well, um, which can't be much bigger than, than Roger's back in the Isle of Man, which is my segue into, into Roger, really. Actually, it's not. It's Chris, isn't it? No. But it's Chris. I've messed that up already. <laughs> it was a nice segue. It was just early. That's all it was. Um, premature again. Premature segue. Um, see, this is how well things are going today. So uh, the watch I've chosen today is um, an Omega Speedsonic 300 Hertz. Um, this is a watch I bought in 2016 when I knew even less about watches than I know now, which I know some of you that <laughs> well will find very hard to believe. Um, but I saw this on eBay, um, thought it was quite pretty, and it said it wasn't working. Um, and I thought, Pff, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with non-working watches. How bad can it possibly be? And got chatting with a guy who owned it a little bit and um, it turned out it was quite bad. Uh, it, it ended up costing me nearly as much as I paid him for a broken watch to, fi uh, in, to buy the thing as it did to fix it. Um, and the, the kind of background story I'd got after I'd committed to buying it and paid him the money was that in the early 80s, he'd taken this into Mappin and Webb where he bought it from. Um, after they'd done a, a battery change a year since the early 1970s and they changed the battery it hadn't worked and they sent it away to, uh, to Omega to be serviced and Omega had come back and said uh, it's going to be in excess of um, 1500 pounds 2000 pounds to fix it and the nice people at Mappin and Webb said well for considerably less than that you can buy a brand new Speedmaster moon watch like the astronauts wore on the moon um, and he said, yes, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Bought a moon watch and put this away in a sock drawer for the best part of 20 years. And thankfully they left it without a battery in, so it couldn't have more damage done. Um, but looking at the, the, the service list, it ended up having a new coil, a new power module, um, quite a lot of new wheels, something to do with teeth, um, a sort of exhaustive <laughs> list of um, expensive. And now is it down? Yeah, I, I mean, it's basically most of the watch, right, Roger? It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty much everything um, other than the chronograph movement was, yeah. the chronograph part of the movement was cooked. Um, so um, it had lots of new bits. At the moment, this watch is not working. Uh, I've changed the battery and it doesn't work. So I, I think something else has, uh, has gone boing. So this will be going off um, back to uh, the chap at Electric Watches when he's back up and, and running, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, because I really love wearing this watch. Um, these were um, incredibly expensive when they were new. I found in the 1971 catalogue, these were about four to five times the price of a regular Speedmaster. Um, so this was like new technology, high technology, very exciting, um, but I think a little bit um, delicate compared to its sort of mechanical counterparts. Um, this fits into the, the Seamaster line of things. So it's got Speed Sonic on the dial and Seamaster on the back, like a lot of the, um, the chronographs from Omega sort of seem to, to slot into that Seamaster line. Um, it is really, really thick. Uh, 
Um, I, anyone that knows that I have flight masters has probably noticed I have this penchant for these big, ridiculous 1970s watches. This is another one. Um, it, the movement is made up of, of layers. So closest to the dial is the chronograph part of the movement, which is a separate module. And then below that, you have the timekeeping um, section of the module and at the back, the power part. So it's just like the Viceroy, really. Mm. Yeah, so it's a similar kind of module construction, modular construction. Um, they made these in a couple of different case types. This is the larger tonneau case. They also did a, a lobster style thing, um, which has got a very shiny dial in. Um, but yeah, this, this is mine. I like it. I wear it quite a lot when it works. I'm not at the moment because it isn't. Um, yeah, any questions from anybody? There was a question about the sound, but unfortunately you just told us it wasn't working, so <laughs> yeah. maybe later. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it makes a very high pitch sound because it has a, a tiny, tiny tuning fork in it that, that vibrates at um, 300 hertz. Uh, and as I understand the, the movement, the way this works is that the power goes to the tuning fork, it vibrates, um, and the vibration notches along a very, very, very tiny index wheel with 300 plus teeth in it, and that creates rotary movement of the hands. Um, I think I've got that right from what I understand. I could be very wrong. Um, Sounds good to me, Mark. Oh, there we go. There you go. Roger says it's fine. So yeah. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> there we go. Sit, stamp of approval. You um, convinced me anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I bought it as well. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Talk with confidence. What you actually say doesn't matter. It's just the confidence. <laughs> exactly. Um, something so, that, that is quite interesting in these as well, I think it's due to the modular nature, is when you start the chronograph, it is not smooth. It, this thing like judders to life. And then when you stop it, it judders to a stop. And when you reset it, it judders to 12. Um, and having seen one fully apart, a lot of the parts of the chronograph look like someone has raided a stationary drawer and used bits of paper clip to make a watch. <laughs> um, it is not an attractive module, um, but it works. So, you know. <laughs> Cutting edge, cutting edge technology at the time, wasn't it? I mean, it is quite groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I suppose, like, uh, there's part, part of me that thinks that many watchmakers did not expect people like us nerds to come along sort of 40, 50 years later and want to look at the inside of these things and mm. then criticise their work because it looks like a paperclip. But, you know, yes. I definitely couldn't have done any better. So All the know. best springs <laughs> look like paperclips. <laughs> <laughs> it does mean they're nice and thick, but um, yeah, any any other questions, anything, or should we, we move on to the next bits and pieces? I think we should move on. Yeah, okay. So we're going to carry on with this slide sharing. Matt's going to be running the Q&A because I can't see it. Um, so this was my Speed Sonic. Um, and now we're going to go back to Roger um, with the thing I, I suspect a few of you have been waiting for, which is one of Roger's own watches. Um, oh. And Roger, you're going to have to tell me when to click through. We have another video. Okay. Here. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> Right. Well, also, do tell me if I'm waffling, and uh, you, you know, I don't want to, you know, for us all to run out of time. So um, I'm no, waffling now, good. aren't I? We're but, all good. Um, so yes. So the series four is um, is now nearing completion in the workshop. So that's why I'm talking about it. Um, unfortunately, it's all just been put on hold due to our current circumstances with uh, uh, COVID nineteen, but. Um, it's been a, a, a big, big sort of project. And I launched the watch in 2015 at Salon QP. And it's taken this time to bring it to production. And uh, the first image is obviously um, of the prototype watch. And we're now at the stage where, I mean, certain, there have been certain design changes to that watch. and the layout of the calendar will be slightly different. We've got more levels in the dial and so on, which I like, which provides a bit more three dimensionality, which I like in my watches. Um, and we're at the stage now where we have three ticking mechanisms in the workshop and we're just waiting for the, this whole situation to pass so we can get our cases hallmarked, get the cases, uh, case, the watches cased up and get them delivered to the clients. So, um, I can just show you the next image, uh, please, Matt. Uh, sorry, Chris or Matt. I don't know who's moving them on. That's all right. Um, <laughs> so, so this is one of the prototype uh, mechanisms. Still, some work to finalise on it, but uh, this is all the under dial work of the watch, and it's um, a triple calendar complication, which has the uh, the day, the date, 
and the month and um, also the phase of the moon. The phase of the moon mechanism is not on there at the moment. And um, what I wanted to do with this watch was to create a mechanism whereby the date has this is displayed on the outside of the watch. Perhaps if we could just go back to the first image, if you don't mind. Um, yes, so we've got this traveling window which goes around the outside of the uh, mechanism. And uh, I think what frustrated with me with other triple uh, calendar complicated watches was that you often have this hand which radiates out from the center of the dial pointing to a dial on the outside of the on the outside and the problem with that situation is that you have a hand which sits across a key piece of information for several days at a time like the you know for example the uh, day of the week and the month it'll hide various parts of that for several days and it kind of defeats the object of the dial i mean the dial should always be legible instantly legible and so that was the challenge with this watch. How do I free up that dial? And this is the result. So if we could just go forward two images, please. And um, that's it. And this is one of the um, solid work assembly drawings of the mechanism and um, showing the various complications with the phase of the moon on and so on. And uh, click on to the next one. Thank you. So this is with the two dials removed and this just shows the, the sort of the mechanism. And as is typical with my sort of work, again, it's, it's very three dimensional, lots of things happening in there. And um, it's just the style of watchmaking that I've developed over the years. And it seems to sort of serve me well. Um, the sort of final mechanism, sorry, final image, um, if we could get onto that. So this just shows the uh, uh, the calendar. So if you keep a BDI on the outer aperture and then the day of the week and the month and then right at the very end of this video it should all nicely click over with one bang. That's it. And that's what's taken four years to sort out basically. It's been a uh, it's been a massive job. I mean, there was one set of designs that I had to completely scrap, and that was just because I was going down the wrong route. I was becoming it was becoming over complicated, over complicated, and um, as a result, I had to completely rethink the design for the watch, for the mechanism, and so on, and. Um, as I say, now today we're, we're at this stage where fortunately we've got three movements which are sort of up and running and performing better than expected. Um, when you're designing a watch, you start off with this idea in your head and you know, wonder how on earth you can actually make it functional. And um, you then start to form ideas for the complication, the mechanism that needs to power this. And um, Eventually, I think it was about a year ago, I got the prototype complete and it was all working fine and I was very happy. But with all these things, there's this niggling doubt, you know, was it a fluke? You, you know, I'd only just built one watch. Is this really going to work? Are the guys in the workshop going to be able to translate my ideas and thoughts and build more of these watches? Um, and so it's been a bit of an anxious sort of year, really. But um, I think it's a reflection on where we are now with the workshop. And uh, we've got, uh, an actually, actually, we've been in this workshop now for two years, pretty much to the day. And uh, it's in an incredible position now. And we've got some incredibly, you know, really bright watchmakers, really talented watchmakers working here. And they've been responsible for building these three mechanisms, taking them from the very start to the finish. And as I say, it's really rewarding for me to <laughs> A, find out that my designs are okay and that other watchmakers can translate those designs and, you know, build watches.
So it's, it's been very exciting. Congratulations. There Thank are a couple, of, a couple of questions that have come, come in, if you don't mind. Yeah. One um, from someone called Great Par. How do you secure such, well, sorry, such heavy hands to the center wheel without them being too fragile or falling off? I guess that assumes yeah, they're heavy, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they are, um, yes, I suppose they are heavier than normal, but they are thicker and so therefore they're mounted onto an arbor, which is, you know, enough friction to keep it all in place. So um, you design, I suppose you design with what you're working with. Um, and the whole mechanism is designed around you know i've got this sort of idea that i want to build watches which will last for hundreds of years and in my mind i have achieved that with these particular watches and so i design everything to be extremely robust and substantial and yet hopefully keeping some finesse to the watch so it's it's my design approach seth says he, he likes how much the detent springs are mirrored for the day date. So you've got both of them coming in from, from either side. Very well spotted. My goodness. Yeah. That's one a good answer a bit detail. Like a paper, I'm impressed. Yeah. One looks a bit like a paperclip apparently. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I, I'm now inspired by paper, paper clips. Let's just wait till the series six comes out. Um, Nick says, what does the W stand for? Um, on my name. In your name or in your brand. Yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, William. You heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. Did nobody um, know that? Uh, yeah, I knew that, but I didn't want to spoil the surprise. <laughs> um, James Vincent's asked about Series 5, so he obviously hasn't seen all the, the, full, the full list of watches that you're working on. Yeah, yeah. So the Series 5 is really just um, a renamed open dial, my Series 2 open dial. And... Um, yeah, the, the, the open dial, I presume people know, but um, I first built that in 2010. And that was in response to, I suppose, you know, trying to get my name out there and trying to show that the level of fin finishing that we were putting into our watches. So the best way to do that was to remove the dial and expose what yeah, was under expose there. It all. There's nothing, there's no way to hide once you've done that. No, exactly. Um, Which causes question. problems. <laughs> no, well, for other people, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, a quick question on the, the, the carriage, the calendar carriage itself. What material is that, that made from? Is that blued steel or? The calendar carriage. You know, the, um, the, 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 the actual. Oh, the indicated. Indicated, the indicated. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, this one on this uh, video is steel and it will be eventually blued. But um, again, we'll be swapping those out depending on what the client wants, the client. whether it will be yellow gold or red gold, depending on the case and dial combination. But this, this particular one is for a platinum cased watch. Very good. Which will have blue steel on. Um, right, there are a few that have come in on the Q&A that aren't exactly related. So do you mind if okay. we have a, get, get, get through some of those? Yeah, yeah, fine. Um, Hervé's asked, do you think something as innovative as the coaxial could still be invented? i.e. that there's another invention for, for wristwatches out there? Um, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the, um, who knows? There could be an even better statement than the coaxial out there. Um, I've been trying to think of one, but I haven't <laughs> it yet. If, um, You've done if quite there, a lot of work already on the coaxial. Well, yes. I mean, we've. I mean, it, we've done a huge amount of development, and we've trans. Well, we've not transformed it. What we've done is we've proved out George's theories. That's what I've yeah. been able to do over the last sort of thirteen or so years. But um, to get back to the point, I mean, w another thing actually, we're working with uh, Manchester Metropolitan University at the moment. Well, we were until this situation arose, um, and. Uh, you know, we are looking at nanotechnology in watches and the ultimate goal is to remove lubrication from a watch. So um, things, you know, that's progressing and it's progressing well. Um, I mean, that would be a big, be the next big thing, perhaps. Yeah. yeah, leap forward. So who knows? Eddie, Eddie is a high school senior in the US. 
He's okay. done a bit of watchmaking and some pocket watch restorations. He's planning on designing and building a clock from scratch. Would you have any general advice you might be able to give him? Start off by designing the dial. The dial is the most important feature of any watch. If you get that wrong, then nobody will want to buy it. So um, start with the dial, then the case, and then work on the movement, then design the, move, the mechanism behind that. I think that's the best advice, and that's, again, something I learned from George. Uh, George used to complain about these uh, wristwatches, which had gasometer dials, as he called them, very confusing dials, which make it impossible to tell the time at a glance. So get the dial sorted, and you'll be well away. And I suppose the next bit of advice is just start. I've speak to so many people who are wanting to make watches or clocks, and um, the biggest obstacle is starting. And I can assure you that it is a hugely daunting task, as I also found out when I was, you know, sort of 18, 19 years old. But the only way to really get going is just to start, and the day you cut metal is the day that this whole world opens up, and it's, it's wonderful. And it, it'll be away then, all these fears and someone will vaporize immediately. Yeah, you just got to get out of school first, I guess. Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Uh, Kathleen's asked a question as well. She says she can't, well, it's a statement. She says she can't wait for her custom Butterfly Series 6. <laughs> um, I think yes. we'd all like one of those. <laughs> I think this is a bit of a private joke, so yeah. a joke with Kathleen in New York, actually. Hello, Thank Kathleen. You. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> I'll get that was, sorted. <laughs> <laughs> she was a guest last week, so thank you yes. for waiting. <laughs> right. Uh, any other questions? Or should we... I, I, have, I have one quick one, actually. So, uh, Roger, you mentioned that the, the, the hand structure, the hands and the materials change depending on the case and the, and the kind of the customer yes. requirements. How far can someone go with customising one of your watches? Are there limits? Is there sort of a, are there some set things that are available or could someone come to you and say, I like that model. I'd like some crazy things, please. Um, so uh, we, we, I mean, a big part of our business is making, you know, bespoke items. Um, and interestingly, over the last two years, the request for more and more bespoke features has increased incredibly. And I'd say almost all clients are now looking for something unique in their watch. I don't know why this has happened, but literally in the last couple of years, so some people will be happy with different case materials or dial materials or perhaps a different engraving design. Um, but again, there are more requests for people asking for a variation on a theme. So we did a very unique uh, watch for an American client, uh, which we delivered recently. And the um, dial was a series one, but when you reverse the watch, it's the series two mechanism and with the open with sorry with the power reserve had been moved to the back of the watch so that was a one-off sort of really unique piece that we created for a client and um, so it really depends on the client's imagination and budget and time and so on so but yeah it's an increasingly large part of the business really cool Right, should we move on to some of Lee's creations now, Matt? Yes? Why not? Yeah, cool. Okay, yeah. I'm going I'm to click back through some slides that you've all just seen. Let's hope I don't start the video again by accident. Um, okay, so um, Lee, my friend, uh, over to you. Let me know as and when you want me to skip through. Okay, sounds good. Um, so yeah, this is... Uh, this is an ongoing project that is at this point maybe an addiction. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it's turned into, but basically um, I draw a watch every day for, for an hour or less and try and make it original. Um, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work at all. Uh, sometimes I just want to go to bed. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I thought it shows some a few examples of, of these. Um, so yeah, in general, I like to try and explore different, uh, both different drawing techniques as well as um, watch watchmaking techniques or indications. So this, for instance, is a jump hour uh, with a hand that would be on a sapphire disc. Um, 
and uh, then kind of enclosed uh, with a, the sun face. Um, and uh, if you can go to the next one, um, some of them I try and get more into the actual mechanisms. I, to be entirely honest, have no idea if this works in it. It probably, <laughs> it definitely doesn't. Uh, what um, do you think, Roger? <laughs> Actually, it looked quite promising. I may steal those ideas. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and and the I guess with the series, um, I I do I do try and stop at an hour. I could spend all day drawing a watch, but then, um, well, it probably wouldn't be that productive of a day. So this this one is is would have been lovely to add a case to it, but. Um, uh, yeah, 60 minutes comes uh, sometimes very fast. And um, if you can go to the next one, um, I like to have fun with it. And oftentimes uh, when we are looking at um, all of these very glossy photos and renderings on the watch blogs and across Instagram, um, sometimes a little bit of uh, some of the seriousness can kind of communicate a little bit too much so occasionally I, I like to throw a, a little bit of a visual pun or gag in in there so this is the um Odimar Piguet uh, waffle maker um I think they should still launch it I think uh, I think it would be pretty popular um and probably a lot more accessible than the Royal Oak but uh you know we'll see I mean it looks it's delicious a wait list. Yeah. yeah but there'll be a wait list there. oh <laughs> I'll buy one <laughs> And, um, and yeah, if you could, uh, if you could move on. Um, and, and sometimes I like to tie in some other cultural things. So this, for instance, is a drawing I did back in November uh, to commemorate the Blade Runner um, year, Blade Runner year as it is 2019. And so this is the back of a Ming watch. Uh, I believe it's the 1902, their world timer and um, turned it into a futuristic city with uh, lots of, holograms and that kind of thing. And the amazing thing about this project and, and more so about the community of, of people who are, uh, you know, the watch fan basically is that sometimes these drawings um, take on uh, a second life. And so in this case, um, I was able to draw some uh, illustrations specifically for, for Ming and the team. Um, so the next slide shows um, a drawing that was inspired by their uh, release last year, the 1706, with uh, that amazing copper dial and this very interesting pattern. And um, it was just an absolute kind of treat uh, to turn this into a, a sci-fi kind of image. I had um, so much fun. And, um, and yeah, that, that's uh, usually it's, it's like... Um, uh, there are a lot of different ways that the, the drawings can kind of manifest themselves and more in line with some of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, I was very lucky and I feel very honored to have been able to do some drawings for Roger. Um, and so the next uh, slides will show um, some drawings that were made of the Great Britain watch. And one of the things that was so interesting to show in these drawings and Roger mentioned it early was uh, the dimensionality that he puts in and he builds into the into his watches um, and being able to capture that in a, a drawing was for me um, a very interesting challenge um, and something it was also very enjoyable so this is the the dial uh, that shows the the guilloche and some of the heat uh, heat treated markers and then the next image shows the movement and um, all of the layers and uh, engraving, and this, it, it, this drawing it was was um, a challenge just from a setting it up. But it once I was able to kind of get into all of the nooks and crannies, as it were, um, and shading things, it was it, it was just uh, I had a smile on my face. Um, and then one of the most fun parts of this this project were to do um, a couple of more creative illustrations. Um, so the next image shows a, a very close up uh, view of the dial, um, which features uh, Rogers Mini Cooper uh, leading the way in a celebrated rally. So I wanted to tie in a few things um, from the uh, from the Isle of Man, and it was uh, it, this. So this this one was also quite fun. 
uh, quite fun to draw and um, and also just to be able to show the guilloche work um, in a little bit more detail. And then the next image uh, features the coaxial escapement, um, but turned into a castle. Um, and it, it was quite interesting figuring out which parts of the mechanism could uh, communicate as a, a piece of architecture. But again, going back to the dimensionality and the robustness of all of the things that are in Roger's work, um, the turning it from a watchmaking part into a, into a piece of architecture was, was um, uh, turned out to be quite straightforward. And, um, and yeah, so these, these drawings were just uh, a lot of fun and uh, I was just kind of over the moon to be able to uh, experience getting to draw them. And I have the pleasure of looking at these every single morning because they're in our <laughs> hallway at home. <laughs> so they're wonderful creations. Thank you. Have you, um, have you worked with anyone yet on a, on a watch, watch design? Yes. Um, so I've, I've done some work on, um, yeah, moving from, I guess, drawings into design. Last year, uh, I was able to collaborate with Habring 2 uh, on their Doppel Perpetual, um, uh, Perpetual Calendar uh, chronograph that they released. And I um, was responsible for all of the typography on the dial. So um, Richard had approached me with uh, basically a, a design challenge for the hour numerals. He had the 12 numeral set up from the, uh, from the regular Doppel chronograph, but had yet to kind of design the rest of the set. And from there, basically the project just bloomed into um, doing the numerals for what became the, the date display and then the, the days and months of the week. So that was a uppercase alphabet. Um, and that was, so that was basically my first, uh, first foray into um, designing, designing something that would exist on uh, on uh, in the metal uh, instead of just on a piece of paper on a post on Instagram, uh, which was yeah, very exciting. Um, Dan Wilson asks how much time you spend planning each of your daily illustrations, or do you just sit down with a blank sheet and and turn on the turn on the stopwatch? So that yeah, that's actually it's becoming increasingly more difficult um, to to design or to plan these. Um, Sometimes there, there have been some nights where I, I've sat and stared at a piece of paper for an hour before starting the drawing. So I don't actually take the planning time into the, the 60 minutes of the drawing. Um, but uh, sometimes it's, if it's um, a specific uh, movement aspect or an indication, um, the drawing will start from there and then I'll try and figure out um, how the rest of the design fits around that within the hour of drawing the watch. And sometimes I'll try and figure out as much in my head before. And then as soon as the pencil hits the paper, that's when the 60 minutes start. But it, it, can, be, it can be an excruciatingly long time before actually starting the drawing, coming up with uh, some of these concepts. Amazing. Thank you. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, one thing we haven't done apparently is a wrist check. So what, what are we wearing? Uh, don't know if you can see, so we've got, Roger's got a Explorer. Explorer, uh, yeah. Explorer, yep. as usual. Nothing from Chris. <laughs> Lee? I've got uh, the, oh, the May 1706 uh, Slate. So this is their um, amazing blue-gray dial version. I've still got the Harbouring. Um, ooh, questions come in about resonance. Roger, are we, are we, have we got enough time to talk about F.P. Jean and Armin Strom and resonance? Well, you can on try. On um, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> Well, give it a go. The question is, <laughs> do we think, <laughs> do we think that Armin Strom version is using it correctly? I.e. having two wheels that are, sorry, two escapements that are physically attached with that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I haven't studied it in great detail, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. I'd have to say, to say the same. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's really cool because illustrating it is is half the it's half the difficulty of resonance. Yeah, I would have thought um, so. Yes. Yeah. 
I'll be able to speak authoritatively if ever I do one. When I do one. <laughs> Series seven, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Roger from Tom. As a fellow Manxman, do you ever hide any other Easter eggs on your watches other than the um, three-legged logo? We, we, we should have done one, shouldn't we? A sort of a Isle of Man Easter, Easter bunny sort of launch, really, shouldn't we? But uh, maybe next year. Next year. Very good. There's a question in here, which, which I'm, I... Um, there's a couple of questions, actually. One says, can Roger show us some of the tools and how they work? And I'm going to answer that one and say, not today. Um, <laughs> uh, we haven't got time. And um, as you can see, Roger is not exactly dressed for, for watchmaking today. He's, uh, he's relaxing. It is Sunday. Um, there's also a question in here about um, a good place to buy 60s and 70s Omega watches, such as Dynamics. Where's the best place to get one apart from eBay without getting ripped off? I'm going to answer that one again and say, don't assume just because it's on eBay, you're getting ripped off. Um, as always, buy beware, do your research first. You can find bargains by scraping through muck. Um, so don't write off a place just because you've heard bad things. Um, there's lots of good stuff out there, as you saw from um, Rogers Hoyer and uh, my currently non-working Speed Sonic, both found on eBay. Um, there, there's some good stuff out there. Um, we are, we are just about at the hour. Has anybody else on the panel got any questions or anything they'd like to say? Oh, from the panel, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, it's all been very good, very enjoyable. If you want a tour of the workshop sometime, just let me know. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that, so. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, no, so it's been fascinating for me. Yeah, a lot of fun. Well, thank you, thank you both for joining us. Yeah, pleasure. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I am going to, uh, for anybody that's been watching this and has maybe had to step out to cook dinner or deal with pets or screaming children, don't worry. This has been recorded. I'm going to edit it together as long as the recording is okay and it will be live uh, tomorrow. Um, thank you to Lee and Roger for joining us. Um, thank you to Matt, my co host, for co hosting and being the co host with the mostest um, and dealing with the QA while I was locked in a screen share. Um, and thank you to everybody that's joined us today and asked questions. Um, we are going to keep doing these for as long as we possibly can and bringing interesting people together while we're all um, locked away at home. And then hopefully, when uh, we're allowed back out of our houses again, um, Matt and I might sneak over to see Roger and ask him some difficult questions face to face. <laughs> that sounded more threatening than I meant it to. I didn't mean it like that, Roger. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this has been the third time for a pint virtual get together, uh, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thank you.